Bonsoir à tous. C'est un plaisir de vous accueillir à cet événement. C'est la première fois que Thomas Campbell vient en France. Euh, en tout cas, pour un événement d'une telle durée. Quoi. Et on est vraiment ravis de, de l'enthousiasme dont vous faites preuve. Donc, euh, je ne vais pas monopoliser, monopoliser la parole très, très longtemps. Hein. Euh, Aujourd'hui, c'est... Euh, euh, c'est une découverte en ce qui me concerne, à mon avis, qui peut vraiment changer nos vies. Quoi. Euh, je connais euh, Tom Campbell depuis un petit bout de temps déjà. Et euh, c'était une rencontre assez euh, remarquable, même après euh, de longues années de, de démarches euh, aussi bien scientifiques euh, que philosophiques, euh, que psychologiques. Et je me dis, il bah, faut vraiment qu'on fasse, euh, fasse venir euh, Tom en France. Bon, J'ai plusieurs tentatives infructueuse. Et voilà, ça va se faire. Combien d'entre vous sont là demain pour, pour le séminaire Fabuleux, fabuleux, super, super. Vous savez où ça se passe Vous vous êtes bien repéré Impeccable. Donc je, je vais laisser à la parole à temps. Bon, je vais aussi saluer les, les non-francophones très rapidement. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome in Marseille. Uh, with a very good reputation, as you know. Uh, <laughs> so we are very happy to welcome you in this event. Uh, we've been preparing for this for many, many years. I've met Tom, that was, uh, I don't remember, that was 2005 or so. Uh, and I was, uh, I was really excited by the work, being a scientist myself and being a researcher, uh, both uh, in physics and, uh, and also in psychology, um, work-related psychology and philosophy uh, and the practitioner for a long time of meditation, I was just excited to, to, to see his work. I found it really amazing. You know, right brain, left brain together, experience, theory, nicely integrated in a scientific model, no beliefs, and I think you really enjoyed it. Uh, how many of you are coming from abroad? Okay, who is coming from from America? South America? North America? Then you? So welcome. Uh, we are honored to really to uh, to have you here. That's uh, an amazing trip, isn't it? Huh? So, <laughs> yes. So once again, welcome. And now just leave you to Tom and his magic. Thank you. Hello, it's nice to be here in uh, Marseille. As you guess, I'm Tom Campbell, and this is a My Big Toe workshop. It's going to be in four sections. Uh, Physics, Metaphysics, and the Nature of Reality is the title. This tonight is section one, and section one is just a short overview of the of what we're going to present tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're going to do most of the same topics you're going to hear tonight, except we're going to do them with a lot more depth than we're going to be able to do them here. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Frank Jotambo and the Akasim team for making all this possible. It's an awful lot of work goes into putting on a talk like this. I have the easy part. I just have to walk up here and talk. These people have had the hard part, which is to plan and to risk and to uh, spend many, many hours trying to pull this together. So I, I do appreciate their, uh, their effort in doing that. Okay, I will I'll try to remember to flip these slides as I turn them. Okay. My slides are pretty wordy, but uh, if you can't see them or they're hard to read, I don't know, they are not in French, are they? Um, I thought there might have been another, another French copy going, but maybe not tonight. Anyway, uh, 
If they're hard to read, then don't worry about reading them because I will say everything that you need. They're just busy with a lot of words and they will be available on my website. So that's why I make them so busy with words. You can go look them up on the website and the words will help you remember what it was I was talking about. So the slides are kind of optional, except for maybe one or two where we have graphics, but most of them are just words and you can ignore them. Uh, if you can't read them, then it's not, a, it's not a problem. You won't miss anything. Okay. Um, that website is, let's see, get this. That website is here. That's the website. And here you can find um, about 125 videos on YouTube that are all of my workshops, interviews, lectures, basically everything that I've done that I can capture on tape and, and voice, I put up there for free. The books themselves are also for free on Google Books. Okay. Okay, I'm going to speak about, oh, no, I'm not. Different slide. Old slide. Oh, well, I'll just do this anyway. We have a slide that's missing. We thought we swapped slides or swapped, uh, swapped uh, the slides there, but evidently it didn't work, so that's all right. We'll make it up as we go. I'm going to speak about a totally new perspective on or a new model of consciousness, which, when understood, also provides a totally new perspective on physics, metaphysics, philosophy, theology, the paranormal, and the origin, purpose, and nature of our multidimensional reality. The scientific model logically solves the hard problems, that is, the seemingly unsolvable paradoxes of all these various disciplines with no new hard problems added. Many of these hard problems have been worked on for centuries. If this new perspective didn't represent a wholly new paradigm, it couldn't possibly be true. New paradigms are always difficult to see at first, but when you do see it, everything falls into place, becoming much clearer and simpler. Unexpectedly, the major conceptual step required to shift to this new paradigm is presently taking place within mainstream physics. And that's the, uh, the advent of physicists now seeing that we are indeed living in a, uh, an informational reality, an information-based reality, which we call a virtual reality. I've only enough time to prevent a quick look at a few of the main concepts. Okay, this schedule lets you see, uh, let's see, I can use this one. This schedule lets you see just what we're doing. That's, so as you see, we just have a, a short part of the whole program that's going on this, this weekend. That's uh, all there is today. Um, the rest of it is going to not only be me talking, but we're going to do some some work with our intents. We're going to uh, talk about meditation, some different ways to meditate, uh, the goals in this meditation, at least three or four different ways we'll, we'll go over. Then we're going to do some practice with healing, using our, our intent to heal and remote view and things like that. And the reason I do that is because one of my phrases that you've probably heard if you've followed my work is that if it's not your experience, it can't be your truth. You have to experience um, the larger reality before it actually becomes real for you. You've probably also heard me say that you need to be open-minded and skeptical. And you need those in equal amounts. You need to be as equally skeptical as you are open-minded and as equally open-minded as you are skeptical. So I don't want you to believe what I talk about today or the next several days. That's not the point. Believing it won't help you grow, won't help you become something more than you are. Believing it is not really very valuable. Whether you believe it or disbelieve it, it's all about the same. It doesn't matter too much. You need to understand it at a personal 
intuitive level, which requires experience. So that's why I do some of the, the healing and the remote viewing and that, the, just to give you the tools so you can go off and experience it yourself rather than having to either believe or disbelieve what I tell you. Okay. All right, so we'll do those on the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll do that sort of stuff, but not, not today. Okay. I'm here today because I wrote these three books. Uh, they are uh, free on Google Books and for sale in all the usual places. This uh, white box here, whoop, wrong one, this. The white box gives an idea of what they're about, okay? Th what the books do is present a theory of consciousness and reality. And I was surprised as anybody when I found out after completing a theory of consciousness and reality that the same ideas, the same concepts, the same logical process also solved the big outstanding physics problems. I could just take the same logic and apply it to the double slit experiment and there was you know, a good reason of why particles are probability distributions, why the speed of light's a constant, and on through other uh, physics problems. So it uh, turned out to be more than I thought, and then I realized that once you understand consciousness, you understand everything else, because consciousness is fundamental, and everything else is derived therefrom. Okay. So my work has steadily been gaining visibility and credibility among professionals, so here I am today offering you a new perspective on a large set of old problems. Okay, the reason my work has been steadily gaining visibility and credibility is that the My Big Toe is good science. It has no unusual assumptions. It's tightly logical. It works. That means it fits all the data points logically. And the main and most difficult paradigm shift this theory requires is rapidly moving into the mainstream of physics, and that is reality's informational. All I can do in the next few hours is present a short overview to let you know what this new perspective is all about. Logical derivations from first principles are available, but would take much, much longer than we have tonight. I will hope to do much more of that over the next three days. But even then, you will have to probably go to the books in order to get the, the details. I assure you that there are no logical gaps or assumptions that leap over problems in this theory, though such gaps are unavoidable in such a short summary. Okay. All right. A little introduction of who is this guy anyway, and why does he claim to know anything about consciousness? I'm a physicist, and physicists and consciousness researchers generally don't go together, but sometimes they do. And uh, I looked pretty normal for a long time, went to college, graduate school, did research in experimental nuclear, um, you know, got my first job with the government in uh, technical intelligence, making computer models, and then moved on to national missile defense and sensor systems, radars, models. I've done a lot of things, mostly ending up with uh, risk analysis, working for NASA at the end. So I've been a, not an academic physicist, but an applied physicist. I like to say I worked in the real world as opposed to the academic world, but that's just my bias. Okay, I, for the last 10 years of that, I was a, I was a consultant. I picked my own jobs and, and uh, I like that. The, uh, the key to understanding me as a scientist is the open-minded and skeptical. That's the, that's the key. In this phase, when I was in, the, uh, in school uh, and shortly thereafter, I was probably a lot more skeptical than I was open-minded, like most scientists, most physicists. Okay. 
I had only been working for a few months when I was introduced and ran into uh, Bob Monroe. And I don't know if you all know Bob Monroe, but Bob Monroe um, was a businessman and owned a, a cable company. And he also wrote three books. The first one was Journeys Out of the Body, and then it was Far Journeys, and then Ultimate Journey. He had what's called out-of-body experiences. They scared him to death. He tried not to have out-of-body experiences. He went to a psychiatrist and said, what's wrong with me? And finally, since nothing really seemed to be wrong with him, he tried to experiment with them. Say, well, if I'm stuck with these things, let's see what they do. By experimenting with them, he learned, he, he found out that they were indeed real because he could gather information, he could see things and know things that he shouldn't have been able to see or know. So he knew they were real. He could interact physical, with physical systems with them. Uh, so he wrote this book, and he didn't want to be just Bob Monroe, the guy who had crazy experiences. He knew these experiences were real, and he said, let's make them science. So he built a science lab. He was fairly wealthy, lived on a large estate, so he built a building, and, and uh, it was sort of the build it and they will come sort of Thing. He really didn't know what he was going to do with it, but he knew he had to build it, so he built it. And just about the time he got finished, myself and a, a friend of mine, Dennis Menerick, an, an electrical engineer, just got introduced to him, and he was looking for scientists, and we were both anxious to learn something new, so we made a deal. And we told Bob that we would be his scientists and help him come up with experiments and do the protocols and we would also build equipment and, and help furnish his lab. And what we wanted from him was to teach us what he knew about the larger reality. Because if we couldn't experience it, you know, it wasn't ours. And it, we probably couldn't believe it if we couldn't experience it. So that began a long series of years. I spent 15 to 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe for about five years. It's a lot of hours. That's like a half-time job doing consciousness research and a full-time job doing physics. So it was a busy, a busy time. Um, now, some people may then associate me with the out-of-body phenomena, but that's not what this is about. Okay, the out-of-body phenomena is just a small Small detail. Oh, we lost. We're losing sound, I'm afraid. Hello? We still there? Okay. We came back. Good. <laughs> Out of body is a small detail in this. This is a theory of consciousness, a theory of everything. And of all of that, out of body is just one little experience, phenomena that you can have off here on the side. It's not really what I'm about. And it's not really what, what this is about. It's just where I got my start. And the reason that I, that I ended up writing these books is being a physicist, what, what we physicists do is model reality. That's our job, to find out how reality works, and we model it. Well, I was the, I was the lone physicist at it uh, with Bob Monroe, and the other people there were in other fields. And it was my job to figure out how it worked what was going on. So I worked on that, tried to understand it, and after about a year or so with Bob Monroe, I could go out of body whenever I wanted to. It was a go on demand sort of thing. It was easy. I could repeat, I could repeat it you know, precisely, and I found that I could do experiments. I could do science in the larger consciousness system, in the larger reality. So I did a lot of experimenting there. You know, you try something and see how it works. And then you change a variable and see how it works to see what that variable had to do with how it works and so on. And it takes a long time and it's tedious like any other kind of science. But eventually I thought I understood what the parameters were and how it worked. And that was mid 1990s. And I sat down and decided I would write it down. So that's where these books came from. I was going to write a book and 900 pages later, I realized it was either going to be a very big book or it was going to be more books. So that's why it ended up a, a, a trilogy. Okay. 
So out of body is just a small part of it. It was it was the um, it was the springboard that I needed in order to do the science, do the experiments that let me understand how it all worked. So that was the that was the idea. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about physics first, uh, then philosophy, and finally into metaphysics. Okay, first, what's the, what's the uh, difference between a big toe and a little toe? Well, maybe first, what's a toe? A toe is an acronym for theory of everything. Albert Einstein started, I think, what was the first toe, at least in modern times. It's called unified field theory. And what he was trying to do was unify quantum mechanics and relativity. Because quantum mechanics and relativity fundamentally disagree with each other. They're philosophically uh, incompatible. Okay, they, if, you, if you take the, the philosophy or the assumptions, let's say, that one is based on, it's based on, actually, each one's based on two assumptions. Um, and one of those two assumptions is exactly the opposite in the, two, in the two sciences, you see. So one of them denies one of the fundamentals of the other, you see. That's how they knew that there must be a bigger theory, an overarching theory that explained them both because they were just subsets of something bigger because they obviously didn't have all the information. So he started on this unified field theory. He worked on it for some 25 years, last 25 years of his life, and came up with nothing much other than a, a lot of good feelings and attitudes about it, but nothing that he could really commit to mathematics. Okay. Now that was a little tau. Little because it just wanted to unify quantum mechanics and relativity. A big tau has to have a much bigger picture, and the big tau has to unify the objective and the subjective, not just the objective. It has to include consciousness. It has to, it has to include um, purpose, point. Why are we here? Why is this reality here? What are we supposed to do here? You know, all of that is an important part of our being. And a big toe, if it's really a theory of everything, then it's got to talk about all the stuff that's important. Everything has to come out, and it has to come out as a logical um, deduction. Okay. Um, so uh, this, this uh, big toe is going to have to derive a little toe. So the little toe has to be a part of the big toe. Uh, it's just a, uh, it, has to, it has to be a more comprehensive, more, col more complete science. Okay, so any uh, big picture science capable of producing a big toe must provide a better, more complete physics as well as a better, more complete metaphysics. But now this, this big toe that I'm going to talk to you about, it also answers a lot of these, these hard problems in theology, in um, biology, and in philosophy. There's a lot of questions that have been hanging in those fields that also get solved here. All right, on to science. This is a double slit experiment set up. And this is the first time that the scientists, when they did this, was back in the 1920s, early 1920s. Okay, and by the 1925 or so, they had come up with, a, with an idea of how and why it worked. It was called the Copenhagen Interpretation. And that interpretation has pretty well stuck right down to the, to the present moment. Um, what happened was that, maybe I can, since I'm wired here, I can walk around. What happened was that everybody knew for, I don't know, almost a century, that if you had waves, waves were coming in this way toward this double slit, which is basically a barrier with two lines cut in it, two holes cut in it, that if waves came in there, and water waves, sound waves, electromagnetic waves, light waves, didn't make any difference. This is just the characteristic of waves, that when the waves got to here, some of the wave would go through there and some would go through there. You can imagine water coming up to a, 
a plate that has holes in it. Well, some of that wave will squish through one hole, some of it will squish through the other hole. And because there's a difference in length from here to here is shorter than from here to here. Hopefully you can see that. If that, if that being shorter is by just one wavelength, then the waves that go out, one's going to be one wavelength behind the other, and when they get to this screen, they're going to be like this. They're going to be in phase. Okay, the peaks will be together, the dips will be together, they'll add, and what will happen is that they'll, they'll produce this white spot. Okay, now if, they're, if they are two wavelengths apart, they'll do it again. Another spot, three wavelengths apart, another spot. That's why you have the one in the middle, which is equidistant from here and here. They're in phase because they have exactly the same distance to go. So they superimpose, the peaks go to peaks, dips go to dips, and you get this big spot. Now, one wavelength separate, you get this, but it's smaller. Another wavelength, you get this, but it's smaller, and so on out they, out they go. Okay, so that's called superposition, and what you end up with is what's called an interference pattern because the wave is, is interfering with itself, okay, or sometimes called a diffraction pattern. We've known that about waves for a long, long time. Light did just that. If you shine a coherent light to those, coherent means that it was all... Um, they all were in the same phase, coming up to the slits. That's what coherence means. So, about oh, early, early 1900s, Albert Einstein did some work with a photoelectric effect, and he published a paper that said, guess what? Light is a particle. I've been able to show that light has a specific momentum. Well, momentum means particle, a little chunk of mass. So light is a particle. And the physicists looked at that and they said, light can't be a particle. We already know light is a wave. Look at this double slit experiment, light's a wave. And yet he had evidence that it was indeed a particle. So they found a way to get just one photon at a time shot at those slits, you see? Just one photon, one particle, shot at those slits. And what they expected to happen was this. The photon would either go through that slit and hit the screen back here, or go through this slit and hit the screen there, because that's what particles do. And they were thinking that, well, one, photo would, one photon would have to go through one slit and hit at one spot. It didn't work out that way. When they fired one photon at those slits, they got this pattern again. That was very surprising. Now, one photon at a time means that, that it would come through here. One would come through here. Well, we didn't know where it came through, actually, is the point. But anyway, one would come through here and just happen to go there. The next time, maybe there. The next time, there. They just kind of hit all over. But after you threw maybe, you know, 100 or 1,000 points through there, you could see this structure coming out. They would come through the slits and distribute themselves according to the structure. Nobody could figure that out. So they said, well, let's put a detector on here. Has something to, you know, something's going on here. Let's see if we can tell what's happening at that slit. So let's put a detector there. And every time a photon goes through it, because you can't see a photon. Uh, one photon, you don't notice. It's just like, it's invisible and you fire it at the slits and something happens on the screen eventually if you add up enough photons that you can see. So nobody actually could see what slit it went through, so they put little detectors here. That's what these little red boxes are. They put detectors and they detected every time a photon went through a slit, they could say, ah, there's one. And if it went through the other slit, they knew that too. And what happened then, they got this distribution. It, went to, it looked like a particle. So now we came up with the principle of light and particles being complementary. It's what the physicists call it at some times. Light is a wave. I mean, light waves and particles is complementary. Sometimes light's a wave, sometimes light's a particle. It just depends on how you measure it, you see. So that was the big mystery. And almost 90 years later, it's still the big mystery. 
not been a whole lot of progress on, on this, and you'll, you'll see that in a, in a minute. All right, the next slide will show you what the, what the answer was. As they struggled with this issue, they realized that they could get the right answer if they assumed that the photon wasn't a photon at all, but a probability distribution. And here's a little picture of a probability distribution. There's probability on that axis, and there's distance on that axis, and, you know, it's somewhere in there. And that curve that I have there is really goes out to plus and minus infinity and has a peak someplace, but that peak is broad. This peak is much broader than these slits are apart. So when the probability gets to those two slits, some of the probability goes through one slit and some of the probability goes through another slit. Now you have to stop thinking particles. You have to think just mathematics. Some of the probability goes through one slit. Some of the probability goes through the other because probability can do that. Particles can't. Particles go through one, you know, they don't go through both. Probability goes through and the probability interferes with itself and when it does it creates this pattern. Okay, that made uh, good sense. And then they used the terminology that when it got to where the measurement was made, which is here, the measurement was made where they collected the, the particles that went through, they said that the probability function, the wave, fun the wave function, because this is a wave, probability waves, not anything matter waves, but probability waves, that the probability um, function collapsed to a physical manifestation. That was the wording that the physicists used. Now here, with these detectors, this is where the measurement is made. You see, in this experiment, it remains probability until it gets to here. This is the present where the measurement's made. Here, with these detectors, this is the present where the measurement's made. And when you detect a photon, that collapses the probability wave to a particle, to a physical manifestation, and after it's a particle, all it can do is do what particles do, which is go in a straight line. And that's all the choices it has. Once a particle, it's a particle. So then they realized that these little things, and they did the experiment with electrons, and then they did the experiments with hydrogen atoms, and then they did it with bigger molecules, and the biggest one I know of is what's called a buckyball, which is 60 carbon atoms in a big arrangement. It looks like a big soccer ball. And it's a pretty big and heavy molecule, as molecules go. And it works exactly the same way. So it doesn't have to do with kind of magic photons that have strange properties. This is just a property of matter. And the scientists would say that if you threw a toaster at it, it would work just the same if you could get all the experimental requirements right, which you can't for something that big, you know, it, it, uh, it's, it's, you can't do that experiment. Well, the, the, the issue here uh, then was called the measurement problem. And if you Google the measurement problem, you'll get this sort of thing. Or you can Google double slit experiment, you'll get a lot more about it. And the problem was that, it's, that it made a big difference if you you know, where you made the measurement. You made the measurement here or here, but when you make the measurement, the probability wave collapses and you get a physical manifestation. Up until that time, the particle just exists as probability. So that's double slit. Now, the thought was that those detectors had something to do with it. Somehow, the energy from the detector was interfering with the photon. Well, that's why they went up to electrons and hydrogen atoms and buckyballs, because they're so massive that you can't interfere with them. They just, you know, their momentum is huge compared to the detection. And they saw that detectors had nothing to do with it. It was nothing to do with the detectors. So then they just turn these detectors off. And as soon as they'd turn them off, leave them in place, but turn them off, they'd get this. Turn them back on, and they'd get this. And then they did something that was, that was interesting. Instead of turning the detectors off, okay, they simply turned the recording device off. See, the detectors detect and send the detection to a recording device that says which slit did it go through. So they left the detectors on, detecting. They turned the recording device off, so no data was recorded. And, surprisingly enough, 
they got this. So sure enough, had nothing to do with those detectors. They were not part of what was going on. As it turns out, not only does that happen, but there are newer double slit experiments that are called delayed erasure experiments. And what that means is you can have your particles come through the slits, hit the screen over here and stop. Later, you can determine what slit they went through after they've already hit the screen. Now, I know that's hard to imagine because you think, well, it's got to go through these slits first before it gets to the screen. But these are very clever experiments that use entangled particles and, and uh, other fancy things. And they, they actually can determine later, after the particles have hit the screen, what slit they went through. And what they found out is that all the particles that, that they have information of what slit they go through ended up in piles behind the slits. And all of the particles where they erased that data, now again, they're erasing it after that's already been taken. All the places where they erased the data, they got that, you see. Now that really made them think <laughs> twice because how could it be that after the effect of collecting the data, they could do something that then what they thought changed this to this after the data had already been taken. Okay, well, that's the delayed erasure experiment, and sure enough, that is exactly what happened. I'm not making this up, honest. That's the way the world works. So, that created a, an even bigger problem. The point is here that we have, we have particles are not particles, they're probability distributions. And that's not just, we just describe them as particle distributions because that makes the math work. You can't do quantum mechanics without all the particles just being probability distributions. That's the only way it works. So they are probability distributions. And then when they get measured, either here or here or there, they end up as massy particles. So what's this tell us about our reality? You see, that tells us uh, some interesting things, that our reality is basically calculational because probabilities are calculated. It tells us it's not objective and material because things that are objective and material don't act like that. You see? So that's why it's a very basic experiment that, uh, that's important. Now at the time, Let's see. At the time, people sometimes thought, well, it's measurement that creates the particle. Other times they said it's consciousness that creates the particle because it takes a consciousness to make a measurement. And both of those are close but not right. What it is is it's information. Information makes the problem. It makes the difference. You see in that delayed eraser, it's not that we changed the answer from this to this. It's that the answer was still in probability. The answer hadn't been looked at yet. Nobody looked at this to see that that's the way it was. They erased the, the, uh, the, the detector data without looking at that. So what was on this detector was still just probability because that information wasn't in, wasn't in this reality frame yet, even though it had already happened, the information wasn't here yet. So when we have the information that a particle goes through a slit, then the only thing that can possibly happen is to get a particle that hits right behind a slit. When we don't have any information of where that particle is, that it went through a slit or which slit, then we get this. And if you re erase that information after the fact, it makes no difference. Because this is just a probability until somebody makes the measurement that collapses the probability. So now we see that our reality is information-based. It's the information that's the key. It's not really the consciousness. They can do all this automated without any consciousness around. Of course, that makes no difference. It's not, um, 
You know, it's not the detectors. So it's just the, the information. That's because reality can't be inconsistent. You can't have a reality that has data that says this has to exist and then this doesn't exist. So information has to be consistent even if you change that information before you look at the data. That's the way the world works. Now, these results were so dramatic and clear and so unexpected, so contrary to the belief of scientists at the day and so far reaching that it prompted the very brilliant man who understood this experiment to say some unusual things. Okay, here's Albert Einstein. He said, if we think, this is his unified field theory he was trying to do, if you think of the field as being removed, there is no space which remains, since space does not have an independent existence. S space, gone, you know, no longer part of the reality. It has no independent existence. Um, reality is merely an illusion. Uh, hence, it's clear that the space of physics is not, in the last analysis, anything given in nature or independent of human thought. One has to find a possibility to avoid the continuum together with space and time. In other words, space and time being continuous doesn't work. It needs to be discrete. Okay, but Einstein said, I have not the slightest idea what kind of elementary concepts would be used in such a theory. So that's why he didn't get too far with his unified field theory, up against the wall, couldn't figure out how to make this make sense. Okay. Niels Bohr said, the common sense view of the world in terms of uh, objects that really exist out there independently of our observations, that is, objective reality, collapses in the face of the quantum factor. This is another one I particularly like by Niels Bohr. He says, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Eugene Wigner, Nobel Prize winner, he says it will remain remarkable in whatever way our future concepts may develop, that the very study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of the consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. Now, do these statements sound like scientists? Not, it doesn't sound like the scientists you talk to today. They won't say things like that. Max Planck, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of the mystery we're trying to solve. In other words, there's some entanglement here between mind and our reality. Well, we all know that, right? But they were surprised. Okay. So basically, Einstein and the others are saying that uh, you know, the space, the, the, the reality out there that we think is physical and real is a function of our conceptual scheme. Mind is at the root and basis of this. That information is information that a mind, that a consciousness can observe. So that's the rule, how that works, is that if, if there is information available that tells you what slit it goes through, and they call that the which way information, which way, which slit did the, did the particle go through, if there's which way information available, then, of course, you have to have the particle. So it's all about just information. The scientists at that time were excited, like a major breakthrough was there, and they were all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and you know, all excited, and it was a big flurry of activity. They knew that this was something big. You know, they had, they had uh, basically overturned Newton completely, that uh, objectivism and materialism wasn't the way this world worked. Well, here's quantum mechanics, no, I didn't do that one. Okay, here's quantum mechanics today. I'm gonna quote Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is one of the, he's dead now, but he was one of the best quantum mechanics theorists, at least that I knew of. And he was a very smart guy, made some good contributions. He says, the double slit experiment contains the basic mystery of quantum mechanics. Well, that's true. He, said, he had said, if you understand the double slit experiment, then you, you can understand it all. That's the key. He also said, I don't understand quantum mechanics. When his students said, but Dr. Feynman, what's going on here? Why does it do that? He said, shut up and calculate. 
In other words, he didn't know, and, you know, let's just talk about something else because we just don't know. Okay, and quantum mechanics represents a phenomena that is impossible to explain in any classical way. That means in terms of objective materialistic reality. Okay, uh, here's a quote from a, a professor of physics at the uh, University of Toronto, and I just picked him out, not to single out Toronto, but you know, any, if you talk to physicists in any physics department all over the globe, you will find these same statements. You know, it may be true that nobody can or will understand quantum mechanics in the usual meaning of the word understand. That means in terms of objective causality. So the big question is left, why should particles be represented by probability distributions? How do we interpret that in terms of objective reality? Well, you don't interpret it in terms of objective reality. You just have to accept it at face value. Particles aren't particles, they're probability distributions. So we see that the scientists in 19, early and mid-1920s were excited about something new. By the time it got around to what we'd call contemporary scientists, they were all in denial. We'll never know. We give up. Nobody will ever know. In fact, it's impossible, you see. And why is because they couldn't deal with the fact that was in front of them, and that is that materialism doesn't work. Reality is not objective. So instead, they said, well, it's still, materialism still works, and the world's still objective, but this is just weird science. You see, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's how they reacted to it, because they didn't know the answer, then the answer became impossible, which excused them from not knowing it. So that's what we get. Now, why, did it, why are they in denial like that? What was the big problem? Well, look at the scientific method, right? That's the philosophical pillar of science. And it depends, one of its assumptions is that reality is objective. Scientific method, you know, that's it. So the scientific method doesn't actually apply to our reality. That's a tough pill for scientists to swallow, and it frightens them. Because if that's true, then in their minds, they see reverting back to the bad old days when the high priests of our culture were not physicists, but were actually high priests. And that frightens them. They don't want to go there. All right. Um, what the scientists have failed to appreciate is that the way physics changes is that you have a, an idea of the way the world works, and then you eventually get a bigger idea of the way the world works, and the old idea gets not thrown out, but set aside as a special case. For instance, the world was once thought to be flat. Then we got the bigger idea of gravity, and the world wasn't flat, it was round. But all the surveyors today who survey smaller plots of land, not global surveyors, but survey for a house or something like that, they all base their surveying on the assumption of a flat earth. Because over the length of a house or even a real big shopping center, it's just flat, you know. It's, of course, it's not flat, it's bumpy, but, you know, that's how you do surveying. So the flat earth model is still with us and alive today and being used where it is approximately correct, which is small distances, you see. And quantum mechanics was the same way. When quantum mechanics surpassed classical mechanics, which was Newtonian mechanics, cl classical mechanics became a subset. It's okay, it's not the whole picture, but if you're not going too fast and you're not too small, then classical mechanics works just fine. And probably 80 or 90 percent of the physics that's done in the real world is done with classical mechanics because most of the time we're not going that fast and we're not dealing with things that small. You see, only in um, you know, academia and physics experiments do we have things that are very fast and very small. In the real world, the things we work with, building, engineering, and so on, we don't deal with things that fast, that small. So M Newton's physics is still what's carrying most of the weight today. But that's just an example of how it works. So what's happening now is that the objective reality to which both relativity and quantum mechanics still cling 
is being replaced by a probabilistic and statistical information-based virtual reality. After this mind and culture-wrenching revolution takes place, objective causality will still be a good approximation in the subset of reality where the probabilistic uncertainty is small. So where the uncertainty is small, you see our objective world works well, our objective science works well. Where the reality is bigger, it doesn't. Why did we have trouble with that double slit? Because the probability was plus infinity to minus infinity. Where that particle is was unknown, because it's too small, we can't see it. So it's unknown. And it's because we have all that uncertainty is why we end up with these results. If you were throwing a baseball or a rock at those slits, well, you could measure that down to the you know, third decimal place of where it is in space, and you know exactly where it went, and it will just be a particle. It'll go right through and, and hit the thing. So it's because of the uncertainty. Well, where do we have a lot of uncertainty? With ourselves, with people, right? You've got the hard sciences, and those are the sciences that deal with the stuff. And then you have the soft sciences, which deal with economics, sociology, psychology, medicine. They deal with the people, and they aren't objective either. They're statistics-based. You do research in the soft sciences, you're doing research in statistics. You, you have to find, is the, is the result of your experiment significant according to the statistics that you have done? It's a statistical process, not a, an objective. An objective process is, this is it. It's only this and can be nothing else. A probabilistic process is, well, it's maybe like this, it's maybe like that, we don't know yet, you know, we'll find out later, you know, and we have certain statistics that say the probability that it's like this is that, and the probability that it's like that is this, and everything is a little looser, it's not objective. Okay, so the soft sciences are one step away from the hard sciences because of the probability. Well, now as it turns out, if we start with consciousness, we see that the, the physics that we have now, the materialistic physics, is just a subset that deals with those things with very small uncertainty. And we have a bigger picture in which they are in. Okay, all relativity and quantum mechanics are on the cusp of becoming a subset of a larger, greater truth. Subsets of a big toe, a more complete and holistic science. Though most physicists are not aware of this fact because it's still very early in the struggle for acceptance. However, it will become accept accepted because it answers the big questions in both physics and metaphysics, and I should add in philosophy and biology and in theology. You'll soon find out why potential future physical particles are probability distributions and why C is a constant, C being the speed of light. How a more complete quantum theory applies to the macro as well as the micro world. You see, quantum mechanics actually applies to our everyday world as well. The same concepts, not just the little world. We have lots of places in our world that have lots of uncertainty, and where they do, this applies. It's only where we don't have much uncertainty that, it, that uh, the result, it still applies, but the result comes out the same as, as the materialistic physics. And it'll explain why pair labs, that's Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, why they and other science houses that study mind-matter interaction get the results that they do. Now we can understand exactly why Pear Labs gets what it gets. Um, you'll also find out how synchronicity and the placebo effect work and how to heal someone with your mind as well as who and what you are and what your purpose is. Okay, where are we? We've gone one hour. I think we can go a little bit more than that. Who needs to get up and take a break? We have people here with bladders straining. You want a break or you want to go on? Break? Okay, taking a break.